Hello, my name is Philip V and I am a contributor to Juicebox DAO, which is the DAO that has built Juicebox. If you're not familiar with Juicebox, it's a decentralized funding platform which allows people to deploy a programmable treasury to Ethereum and to use that treasury in order to receive funds, issue tokens to their community and contributors, put incentives on how those funds are issued and control how funds can leave the treasury and how payouts take place. You can do all of these things uh, and some other things in very customizable and programmable ways. And it also allows for you to evolve these rules over time, meaning that as your community grows and what you need from your treasury changes, your juice box project can be configured to meet those needs. It also does all of these things very transparently, which is extremely useful if you're building an open source software project, a DAO, a crowdfund, a nonprofit, a charity, or something along those lines, where it would be valuable for the community to understand exactly how funds are coming in and where they're going and how they're being utilized. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make your own Juicebox project and how you can configure it to meet your project's needs. If you have questions at any point, feel free to ask them in the Juicebox Discord server at discord.gg slash juicebox. There will also be a link in the description. I also recommend checking out the project creation guide, which will have some more details about the information that I lay out in this video, and that'll be at info.juicebox.money, and I will also put a link in the description. So to get started, I recommend going to rinkb.juicebox.money. This is the testnet version of Juicebox, so you don't have to use actual ETH when you're setting up your project. And once you settle on a project configuration, test it, make sure everything works, you can deploy again to the main website. So go to rinkb.juicebox.money and click launch your project. And it will take you to the create page. And on the create page, you can put in information about your project on the left, and then on the right, it'll show you a preview of what your project will look like once it's actually created. So to give you a bit of a sneak peek, this is what a deployed project looks like. This was made by my friend Django, uh, and you can see it has title, some information, a logo, has information about the treasury and how funds are coming in, and then down here, you can see information about how the project itself is configured. You can see where funds are being distributed to, and you can see where reserve tokens are going to. On the right side, you get a feed of all of the information and all of the things happening with the treasury. And you can also, uh, if you decide to do so, contribute to the project here. So you can pay in either ETH, or if you click this, in ETH denominated in USD. So if I want to pay 100 USD, I would do it like that. So back to the creation page, let's say we're making a lasagna as a service company. Um, so we can title it lasagna as a service. Um, and then for our description, we can say we are disrupting the lasagna industry. Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. And we can put a logo. I'm going to use lasagna.jpg. If you want to use an animated logo, you can do so. So here's an example of a project with an animated logo. Um, after that, you can put in important links for your project, so you can link to your project's website. I don't actually own the website lasagna.com, but we'll just use it as an example. You can put a Twitter handle, no need to put a link in there, just the handle and the link will automatically be generated. And you can put an invitation to your Discord server. If you don't have a Discord server or a Twitter, for example, you can leave one of these boxes blank and it'll only put the links that you're actually using. After this, you can move on to project page customizations, the first of which is pay button text. So when someone goes to contribute to your project, by default, they're going to click this button which says pay. But you can change this to say something else. Oftentimes people will change it to contribute or put some emojis there. Uh, for our purposes, we'll put donate because we are a nonprofit lasagna company. And then for our pay disclosure, we can put warnings or relevant information we want people to know before they pay our project. If we go back to this project and we click yogurt, which is what he configured his pay button to say, we can see notice from Django Bango, WTF you doing? So we could put any information there. I think we'll put a warning uh, that our lasagna is extremely tasty. Um, and that is all for the details. Next, we're going to move on to funding cycle. And before we get into the nitty gritty of configuring your funding cycle, uh, I, I should talk a little bit about how funding cycles actually work and what they are. A funding cycle is the base unit of time for a juice box project, and a lot of other configurations are based off of that. So for instance, if you have payouts or funding distributions coming from a project, those will take place once per funding cycle. So you can see these payouts here happen once per funding cycle. 
If your tokens get more expensive every funding cycle, you can configure them to do that. And that will, of course, happen once per funding cycle. Uh, so a funding cycle is just a unit of time. And the most important thing about a funding cycle is that you cannot reconfigure a project during a funding cycle. So let's take this project as an example. We can see if we scroll down here that there are four days left until their next funding cycle. And we can see that there's a 14 day funding cycle duration. So what that means is for the next four days, if I'm satisfied with the way this treasury is configured, I can know that they're not gonna be able to rug pull me because they will not be able to reconfigure their treasury until the start of the next funding cycle. So when you submit a reconfiguration to your project and you do the transaction to change things about your project, it actually queues it up and will only implement it upon the start of the next funding cycle. So back to the funding cycles page. With automate funding cycles off, we can reconfigure our project at any time and it will trigger a new funding cycle upon us doing that. And that gives us a lot of flexibility, but it also makes it harder for our community to trust us. So for our lasagna as a service company, we'll go with a 14 day funding cycle. And that's helpful because it'll also allow us to do biweekly payouts to contributors and other things like that. Uh, so once we decide on a funding cycle duration, which you can set here in any unit of time you want to, we can move on to payouts. Now, before we get to payouts, there's another concept I should talk about, which is overflow. So when people contribute to your project, they receive tokens, right? If I were to contribute one ETH to this project, I would receive 35,845 tokens. And these tokens can be used in snapshot voting strategies for governance, and it's compatible with all sorts of different tools. And if you decide to, you can actually even issue them as an ERC-20 token to work with Uniswap and, and things like that and liquidity pools. Um, but... The way tokens work natively within Juicebox is they actually allow people to reclaim a portion of your treasury funds. So you can actually see this on a project's page. This amount to the left is their distribution limit. And the distribution limit is just the sum of all the payouts. So you can see for this project, there's a 4 ETH distribution to Django.eth. So out of the 15 ETH in this treasury, 4 is going to be distributed. Uh, and you can see it's four out of four distributed and the rest will is considered overflow and overflow allows people to reclaim a portion of the treasury with their tokens. So if I have 1% of all of a project's tokens and I redeem those tokens by default, I'll be able to get 1% of the overflow. And this is really useful because it allows, uh, it allows people to maintain what funds they need for their distributions and payouts. And it allows these extra funds, which would normally just serve as a runway for the project, to not only serve as a runway for the project, but also to serve as a way for the community to exit if they disagree with the direction a project is headed. So back to our project, the way you set this distribution limit is actually through payouts. So by default, you can see payouts are set to amounts. So let's say I want to pay my friend Django. This is his wallet address. And let's say I want to pay him uh, 1,000 USD. So by default, payouts are in ETH, so this would be a one ETH payment. I can set it to USD and I can pay him 1000 USD. And we can add the payout. And let's say I also want to pay his Juicebox project. So what I'll do is instead of doing wallet address, I switch to Juicebox project. I can see the ID is 55, so I'm gonna copy that, paste it in here, and I'll do another 1000 USD distribution. Now one thing to note is this field here, token beneficiary address. A bit of a complicated term, but that just means where the tokens that are minted will be going. So in this case, I'm gonna copy my own address and I'm going to put it in here. So this payment is going to be an 1000 USD payment every 14 days, every funding cycle to Django's project, project ID 55, and the tokens are going to go to my address. So I'm gonna add the payout here. And you can see now that I've added two payouts, my distribution limit is 2000 USD. So the first 2000 USD will be part of my funding, uh, my distribution uh, limit, like my, this, this amount on the left side right here. And then any funds in the treasury beyond that will be overflow, which the community can reclaim. And what's cool about that is it drives each individual contributor's cost to zero over time as the treasury grows. Uh, one thing to also note with payouts is that this is where Juicebox makes money. So there are fees on payouts to individuals. So if you're paying to another Juicebox project, like in this case, for example, there are no fees on this distribution, but payouts to individual wallets, there's a 2.5% JBX membership fee. And that fee goes to the Juicebox DAO treasury, which you can see here, and you receive tokens for that actually at the same exchange rate as you would if you went to this page here. So if I go to this page and I 
put in one ETH and I click add juice and I pay the project, it would be the same as if I paid one ETH in fees. So this allows people who create projects on the platform to have a little bit of ownership over the platform in general. So that is how amounts payouts work. But if you decide that you don't want to have overflow and you want to be able to distribute your entire treasury, you can instead decide to use percentages. So in this case, by default, 100% of funds will be going to the project owner and I could send 50% of funds to uh, Django's juice box project, right? So I could split the funds in the treasury 50-50. And if I do that, that means no matter how much funding I get in the treasury, all of it will be split when I click the distribute button. One last thing to note on payouts is that payouts are not distributed automatically by themselves. You actually have to go to the project and click this distribute funds button. Uh, you can see that they've already distributed the maximum for this project, so there's no funds available for to distribute. But someone has to click that button, and that's a button that anybody can actually uh, click. And same thing with these tokens. Someone has to click distribute tokens. Uh, so back to payouts. I think I'm going to work with amounts payouts because, um, you know, I have... Uh, Django on staff, he's doing something for me, so I'll, I'll add a payout to him for a thousand USD, like I said earlier, and then I will also add re add that payout for his project. And I'll add my own address to receive those tokens, and we'll do a thousand USD. So that is everything for configuring uh, funding. And there's one more restriction on funding cycles, which we'll actually get to in the rule section. So keep all the stuff about funding cycles in mind. But for now, we're going to move on to tokens. So like I already said, when people contribute to your project or donate to your project, they're going to be receiving tokens. And by default, um, the, the mint rate uh, is basically just the exchange rate per ETH contributed. So by default, it's set to 1 million. So if I donate one ETH to this project, I'm going to receive 1 million tokens. This amount doesn't matter too much because ultimately the value of your tokens is kind of relative to the amount of ETH in your treasury and the utility you give it. So uh, don't worry too much about picking a number. The default is totally fine. Um, we'll leave it at a million for now. Uh, after this is reserve tokens. So by default, the person who donates to your project will receive that full 1 million tokens if they donate an ETH. But let's say you use your tokens for governance and you want to make sure nobody can come in and blow a ton of money on the project and then take over the governance process. We can flip on reserve tokens and what this does is it routes some of these tokens to wherever we want. So instead of all 1 million tokens going to the person who donates, if we set the reserve rate to 25%, the person who donates is only going to get 750,000 tokens and the people who we decide will get 250,000 tokens. So in this case, um, I'm not too worried about a hostile takeover, but I want to make sure that uh, Django and I have a voice in governance. So I'm going to add a token allocation and I'm going to copy Django's address again. And I will add a, I will give him 50% of the reserve tokens. So what happens now is when someone goes and donates one ETH to the project, they will receive 750,000 tokens, and then 250,000 tokens will be reserved. Of those reserved tokens, 50% will go to Django, and then the other 50% will go to the project owner. A little bit more on this project owner term, which you may have seen in the payout section as well. Uh, when you create a Juicebox project, you're actually minting an NFT, which represents ownership in the Juicebox project. It's almost like a key to your Juicebox project, and it allows you to reconfigure things and change things uh, about your project over time. So you can transfer that NFT to somebody else if you decide to do so. Uh, so you could create a Juicebox project, for example, and then send that NFT to a Gnosis Multisig or a smart contract or somewhere else to custody the project. So for now, I think this is good for our reserve rate. Next, we have to look at the discount rate. Uh, the discount rate is a little bit of a confusing title, uh, uh, phrase because it's not actually a discount. It makes your token more expensive. This is like a term sometimes used in academia, uh, and it's a discount of the current uh, issuance rate. So if we turn this on and we set this to 10%, that means that our tokens in this funding cycle are actually at a 10% discount to next funding cycle. So they're 10% cheaper now than they will be in the future. So you can see this example play out here. At the start, we have a, you know what, I'll set this reserve rate to 50% just to make the math a little bit easier. So now it's 500 tokens for someone who contributes. So you can see at the beginning, someone will receive 500,000 tokens, but next funding cycle, which is in 14 days in our case, they'll get 10% more expensive 
to 450,000, and then to 405,000, and so on. 10% uh, discount rate is actually quite high because um, this is basically, uh, th th it compounds very quickly, to, to put it simply. So we'll set ours pretty low at 0.5%, and that's a good healthy incentive to keep people interested in contributing to your project earlier rather than later. Uh, but it's not so aggressive such that it'll make it very hard for people to contribute to your project later on. And we will return our reserve rate to 25%. Um, as, as a brief recommendation for reserve rate, uh, we see people go anywhere from 0% all the way up to 80% for reserved rate. It's hard to put a def definite amount on it, and it really depends on how you're using your tokens and your governance process. Juicebox DAO has a reserve rate of 50%, but other projects may have much higher or much lower reserve rate depending on their needs. Okay, so we've set our reserved rate, we've set our discount rate. Let's move on to redemption rate. So in the way that discount rate is an incentive that encourages people to contribute to your project, redemption rate can be used as an incentive to keep funds in your project. Now the way that works is earlier when I mentioned overflow and how 1% of tokens means you can redeem those for 1% of the overflow, redemption rate actually allows you to change that behavior. So if I sent this to 50%, for example, someone with 1% of tokens would only be able to reclaim uh, about half of a percent of the overflow. Or if I set this to 25%, they would only be able to claim a quarter of a percent of the overflow. So the value of a redemption rate is that it is an incentive for people to redeem later rather than earlier, because the first person to redeem is going to be um, losing the most amount of funds for that redemption, because the funds that they leave in the treasury will actually increase the redemption value for everybody else. So this amount is calculated continuously on a bonding curve. So if you're curious in learning more about how this actually works, I recommend you go to info.juicebox.money uh, and there will be some documents there. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, for our project, 25% would be really aggressive. I'm going to set this to 80%, which is a decent incentive that encourages people to keep funds in the treasury. But if they really disagree with the way things are, are headed and they disagree with the way I've configured my project, they can reclaim a good amount of overflow. So that'll be everything for token configuration. So I'll click save token configuration and move on to the rules. These are some last final steps, uh, mostly some little toggles and things that you can change about your project. So the first one is pause payments, uh, which means that I cannot receive any payments. Uh, you might want to use this if you want to do funding in discrete rounds, for example. So Moondow did this to great effect, where they had a 30-day period where you could receive their tokens, and then they reconfigured their project and paused payments so they could no longer receive payments. You probably don't want to enable this when you're setting up your project for the first time, but uh, we, will, we will leave that off for now. Next, we have allow token minting, and this allows the project creator to mint however many tokens they want. We're also going to leave that off. Uh, third, we have allow terminal configuration, which allows you to set the project payment terminals. To learn a little bit more about payment terminals, I highly recommend you go to info.juicebox.money and you can learn about terminals in our learn section. And I also recommend the build section. It's a little bit technical, but has a lot of really, really great information. And I think you'll learn a lot by reading through it, especially this architecture page is very good. Um, so that is allow terminal configuration. If it's a little bit confusing, don't worry about it too much. You can leave it off. Uh, and then the last section in the rules category is reconfiguration rules. And this is what I mentioned earlier when I said that there's a little bit more to funding cycles. So by default, if you have this set to no strategy, you could reconfigure your treasury one minute before the next funding cycle, and that would immediately be, impl be implemented. And now, of course, there's a danger to that in that the community might be afraid of being rug pulled. So what you can do is you can change this from no strategy to a three-day delay. And what that does is it means that you have to submit configurations and changes to your project at least three days before a funding cycle, uh, before the next funding cycle starts. So in the case of this project, they have four days and 12 minutes left until funding cycle five, but they only have one day and 12 minutes left until, uh, or to submit their new configuration. And if they don't do that, then their configuration will actually roll over to the next funding cycle after, and they'll have to wait um, for the next funding cycle to make any changes. So we're going to set it to a three day delay, which is a good amount of time that allows our community to look over changes and see how things are configured and make sure that they're happy with all the 
all the plans that we have for our treasury. You can do a seven day delay here, or you could even do a custom strategy that could do much more than a time delay. But three day delay is a simple amount and it gives us a good bit of flexibility while also maintaining that trust with our community. So now we're gonna click save rules and our project looks completely configured. So if we go down here, we can see our current funding cycle. We're distributing 2000 USD. Uh, we have 14 days funding cycle. We can see when it's gonna start, when it's gonna end. We can see our discount rate here. And we can also see our history. So <laughs> this, there's no history for our project, of course, we're making it right now. But if you go to a project page, you can see their history and you can also see their upcoming funding cycle. So what's queued for the next funding cycle. So if this looks good to us, we can now go down here and click review and deploy. And it'll take us to the review page where we can see our title, our pay button text, all of the information we put in. So make sure to go over this carefully. And if you have any last questions about uh, different configurations, you can of course mouse over these question marks and it'll explain it to you. I also highly recommend if you have any confusion at this stage to go to discord.gg slash juicebox, our discord server. Again, I'll put the link in the description, but feel free to ask a question in there. There'll always be people around to help you out and make sure your project is well configured. So if these things look good to us, we will connect our wallet to deploy. I'm going to connect a MetaMask wallet. Um, so I need to log in and authorize my MetaMask wallet. Um, and then let me do that really quickly. So I'm connecting my MetaMask wallet. Let me reload the page. Okay, back to review and deploy. Everything looks good. Deploy project to rink B. So you can see my wallet is connected and it will now prompt me. So you'll see the estimated gas fee um, and the total amount that it costs. So there's no charge when you're actually deploying a project. This is just a gas fee. If you don't know what a gas fee is, it just goes to maintaining the Ethereum network. Uh, right now we're on the test network. So I'm going to look over everything. If you want, you can look over the data and see how the contract interaction works and then click confirm. So the transaction is now pending. Uh, and we'll have to give it a second here. Uh, the rink B network can be a little bit slow sometimes. So um, may take a second to deploy the treasury. And it looks like our transaction has succeeded. So MetaMask tells us we've succeeded and it takes us to our new project page. And immediately when we go to the new project page, it shows us some optional next steps. So we can set a project handle, which is very important. It allows your project to be searched. So if you go to the juicebox.money website, here's an example of a project that has not set a handle yet. So the juicebox.treasury has not. And if I go to search, uh, you can see that the V1 treasury comes up, which is our old treasury, but our new treasury does not because we still have not set a handle. But if we take the example of Django Bango, the Django project, you can see the handle is Django. So if I search Django, it'll come up in the search. So that makes it a lot easier for people to find your project. Uh, and it also gives you this cool URL right here. So highly recommend setting a project handle uh, just click this button and it'll guide you through how to do that. We can issue an ERC20 token. So by default, uh, to save on gas, our tokens are actually tracked within the juice box contracts, which makes things a lot cheaper when people contribute. But if we want to use ERC20 tokens to uh, deploy a liquidity pool on Uniswap, for example, or use tooling that works with ERC20 tokens, we can do so there. And we can also create a payable address, which is an Ethereum address that enables direct payments without having to go through the project page. For now, I'm gonna click close and we can do these later. So this is what our project page looks like. Uh, you can see that I'm seeing some options since I'm connected as the project owner that you would not see as when you look on someone else's project. So you can see I have the option here to add a handle um, and I have all these buttons down here. Issue ERC20 lets me issue an ERC20, of course. Um, and you can see here there's an option to reconfigure upcoming funding cycles. So if at any point I wanna change something about my project uh, and queue that reconfiguration, I can click on this, I can go into the token section, all these different modals and slides and sections that we just went through we can click here and change those things. So let's say I want to remove a payout, the payout to Django for my next funding cycle. He's not really doing his job. I wanna remove the payout to his address and only keep the one to his project. I can remove that there, click save funding configuration. 
And let's say I also want to set our discount rate a little bit higher. I don't think it's quite high enough and I think our token should be getting a little bit more expensive each funding cycle. So I can change it from half a percent to 1%, click save token configuration and you can see the changes down there are queued up. So now what I can do is I can click deploy funding cycle configuration. It will give me a prompt and I can click confirm. The changes I just made were quite simple, but you can imagine that you could completely shut off all payments to the project or do something very radical. So there's a lot of power when it comes to changing these funding cycles. So now the transaction will start. Transaction has succeeded. And you can see that there have been no changes made to the project. Django's payout is still there. The discount rate is still uh, as half of a percent. Uh, because all of those changes are queued up for the upcoming funding cycle, which will take place in 13 days. So if we go to upcoming, you can see that we have a pending uh, funding cycle, and that has the updated information. I hope this helps. If you have any questions about uh, Juicebox projects in general, or you want to ask about how we could help with your use case, feel free to join the Juicebox Discord server, as I said, uh, link in the description. Feel free to check us out on Twitter or anything else. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always feel free to DM me on Discord. My handle is philipv0001, uh, and that's spelled F-I-L-I-P-V, hashtag number, pound sign, 0001. Um, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope this helps.